First Corinthians chapter 12. And we go, we're going we're to be looking at verses 12 through 31. That's verses 12 through 31. And uh, here we find the church, the Corinth. And uh, what I want to say is how are Christians supposed to function together with all their differences is the question that Paul is going to answer for us today. You see, there's a great challenge. There's a great challenge that must be considered when we look at the local church, the local congregation. In any given congregation, you have all different kinds of people. You have all different kinds of culture in any given congregation. And God has called us all together with all of our differences for us to function together as a unit. And even in our little congregation, maybe about 50 plus people, we have people from different countries. We have Philippines. We have Jamaicans, right? I believe we have Guyanese, if I'm not mistaken. Trinis, right? We got different countries. We got different age group, right? We got different culture. We got people, different Bible, uh, 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 different uh, growth, different maturity. You got those that are able to quote scriptures from Genesis all the way to Revelation. And you got those that, are, that, are, that have, a, have a struggle in finding the books of the Bible. Right? We got different people within our congregation here. Right? And God has called us as Christians to for all of with all of our differences that we should function together. And in the same way, when we look at the church in Corinth, they were very diverse as us. They had Romans, they had Greeks, they had Hebrews, plus they had different miraculous gifts. And so Paul is writing the church in Corinth about how they're supposed to function together, work together, how they are supposed to get along with all their differences, with all their, 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 their different uh, backgrounds. And the lesson for us today as Christians is that how we, how we are to function together as one body with one purpose. Today's sermon is called Today's sermon is called Many Members Different Gifts Working Together. Many Members Different Gifts Working Together. We're going to look at three points this morning quickly. The first point we're going to be looking at is there must be unity in the body. Amen. We, second point, we are united, but we are different. Point number three, we are dependent on each other. We are dependent on each other. And here Paul uses the illustration of the human body. And he describes our, the relationship that we ought to have with each other. And the first thing that Paul wants us to know as Christians is that there must be unity in the body of Christ. Paul says in, 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 in verse number 12, that's 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 12. Paul says, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, also is Christ. He says, think about it. Think about your own body for a second this morning. We have all different members of the body. They all function in different ways, but yet still they are part of the what? They are part of the body. We have our eyes. We have our mouths. We have our foot. They all do different things, and yet we can function without them. 
they function together as a unit. And so it is with Christ's body, he's saying. There is supposed to be a sense of oneness, amen. There is supposed to be a sense of commodity. There is supposed to be a sense of the same goals, amen. Same purposes, same motivation. And Paul explains it like this, he says in verse number 13. He says, for by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink, of that one spirit. In other words, Paul says, as different as we all are, as unique as we all are, we all have the same salvation experience. Amen. Notice what Paul says concerning our salvation. He says, we were all, not some, we were all baptized into one body. Amen. We were all saved in the same way. There is no one here that was sprinkled. Amen. Amen. There was no one here that said the sinner's prayer. There, was no, there is no one here that just believed in their heart to be saved. We all have the same salvation experience. And he continues and says, we have all been made to drink. Of that one spirit. In Acts chapter 2 and verse number 38. The apostle Paul tells us of the spirit of Christ that will be given to all Christians when we obey him. He says, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Notice the two things that we receive when we are obedient to God. Notice the two things that we receive. We receive, our sins are forgiven, and we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In other words, when a person submits, when a person submits to Christ's authority, and that person is immersed in water, something magically happens. Amen. Brother, we can explain it. But something magically happens. And symbolically, the person drinks of that spirit. Amen. The Bible tells us in John chapter 4, 13 through 14, Jesus says, speaking to the woman at the well, he says, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. That is the water that we drink every day. And he says, but whoever drinks, notice what he says, whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst again. Amen. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into eternal or everlasting life. He also says in John chapter 7 verse 38, Jesus says on the last day, that great day of, of the feast, that is the Feast of Tabernacles. That was a great Jewish feast. Jesus stood and cried out saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. This church is a picture of what? Life. This is a picture of life that Jesus is calling here. In John 14 verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to me except he comes through the Father. Amen. This is also a new life. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, it says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a what? A new creation. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Jesus continues and tells us in verse number 38, He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. 39, But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So when we go back to the book of Acts, chapter 2 and verse number 38, we see the fulfillment of this that is given to all believers. When we hear the word of God, when we believe it, when we repent of our sins, 
when we confess Jesus as, Jesus as the Son of God, and when we are immersed in water, we all as Christians have drink of that spirit. There's a saying that says blood is thicker than water. Do you know that saying? Yes. But may I say, brothers and sisters, that the blood of Jesus is thicker than both. Let the church say amen. That means that if I can't count on my friends, if I can't count on my relatives, I should be able to count on the church. Let the church say amen. amen. Because, as, I, as I've said again, the blood of Jesus is thicker than both. The blood of Jesus supersedes both. Jesus says in Matthew 12, verse 50, Anyone that does the will of my father is my brother and my sister. God wants us to know that we are united. Let the church say amen. Now Paul continues and shows us that not because we are united, not because we have a common thread of salvation experience, not because we have all drink of that, of that one spirit, that does not mean that we're not diverse. Amen. That does not mean as Christians that we're not different. Even though God wants us to be united, we as Christians are also different. Which leads us to our second point. We are united, but we are diverse. Verse number 14 through 19. Paul says, follow me. For in fact, the body is not one member, but, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I'm not of the body. Is that therefore not of the body? Verse 16. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, am I not of the body? Is it therefore not of the body? Verse 17. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole... If the whole were hearing, where would the smelling be? But now God has set the members, each of each one of them, in the body just as he has pleased, verse 19. And if there, there were all one member, where would the body be? Paul is making his argument here. Paul asks the question in the mouth of one who feels excluded from the body because they don't have a certain gift. They may say, well, I don't have this gift, or I don't, I don't, I don't, because I don't have this, I don't feel like I'm a part of the body. And Paul is making his argument here, and sometimes what happened is, you've got to understand, church, is that the church at Corinth, there were those in the church that was jealous. There were those in the church that felt like they were excluded because they didn't have a certain gift. And sometimes, as Christians, if we're not careful, we can feel the same way. Well, I don't have this, I have this gift, so because of that, I feel excluded. And God it does not want us to feel that way, right? There is so much work that needs to be done. There's not only one, one thing that, 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 that needs to be done, right? There is so much work that needs to be done. And so God does not want us to feel excluded if, for example, you know, you're not preaching the word. You're not a sick song leader or whatever it is, right? Every part is important. Let the church say amen. amen. Then he goes on to say in verse number 17, if the whole body was an eye or an ear, where would the other part be? In other words, how good would it be if every part of your body was an ear's? Where are you supposed to have an eye, you have an ears? Where are you supposed to have a mouth, you have an ears? Where are you supposed to have an arm, you have an ears? Where are you supposed to have a foot, you have an ears? Do you know the importance of how important it is to have fingers and toes? I don't mind being a finger or a toe. I don't have to be the arm. I don't have to be the mouth. You know, in time past, what they would do is they would capture the kings. And you know what they would do with the kings? They would cut off their big fingers 
and their big toes. And you know why they will do that? You see, the big finger and the big toe is very, very important to the body. The kings weren't able to grab a sword if you don't have a big finger. And if you don't have a big toe, you're not able to run. <laughs> so that's what they would do when they capture kings in those days. The point is that, brothers and sisters, every part is important. Amen. Amen. And that's the reason why the body can all have the same part. There are all things that you do well that I don't do well. There are things that I may do well that you don't do as, as well. Right? Whereas maybe I have a passion for teaching. That means I have to do research and so forth, and I gotta present the message. That may not be your passion. Your passion may be service. Maybe you're a person who just loves to help other people. Right? Maybe you help them with, you know, like a like a like a like a waiter who's always be always there. Service, helping, and so forth. Maybe that's your gift. And that's the whole point that Paul is making here, being a part of the body. The hand is not a very good hearing instrument. <laughs> Amen. The ears is not a very good seeing instrument. The eye is not a good speaking instrument. Different parts of the body do different things. Amen. God tells us, here we see the beauty of the body of Christ. God takes all of these things, all of us with different backgrounds, different culture, different gifts, and he puts it all together for us to work together for the building up of the body and for the glorification of God. Let the church say amen. amen. So, Brother Ramdas do what he's good at. Amen. amen. Brother Admin do what he's good at. Sister Tom want to do what she's good at, right? We all do what we're good at for the glorification of God and for the building up of the body. Let the church say amen. amen. Now, unfortunately, sometimes what tends to happen too often is that we make the mistake of trying to impose our gifts on someone else. We sometimes expect the next person should have a strong of a desire for what we love to do. Sometimes that happens. Remember Mary and Martha? You remember that story? Where Martha was passionate about her service? And no, I, I, I think that that, story, that was her gift. She was passionate about her service. She was in the kitchen. She was cooking and she was, she was preparing the meals and, and she was uh, serving the brethren. But what was Mary doing? Mary was sitting down. She was listening to the message by Jesus' feet. And do you remember what Martha said to Jesus? She said in verse number 40, she says, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving? To serve alone? Tell her. Tell her to help me. Can you, can you, can you see that? She's telling Jesus to tell her to come and help me. In other words, she expected Mary to have the same interest, the same passion about her personal gift. Her gift of service. And Jesus replied, he says, Mary... He said to, to Martha, Mary has chosen the good part, which will not be taken away from her. Now, Brother Reed is not saying, Brother Reed is not saying that you can't encourage somebody. Amen. Amen. You can't encourage someone to do good works. So the Bible tells us in Hebrews 10 and verse 24, and let us consider one another in stirring up. Amen. Stirring up love and good works. But we're not to force, if you will someone to do what we are so passionate about that they may have a different passion for what they want to do. Another thing that can happen is we look at another person's person's gift or next person's passion and we envy that person. 
We envy that person. Or well, you think you're better than me. Because he does so and so and so. Right? And that seems to be the problem in the church at Corinth. They were envying each other. They were menacing each other. Keep in mind that everybody had gifts. I mean, miraculous gifts. They were all had different miraculous gifts. And one person may say, well, I only have the gift of prophecy. I wish I had the gift of tongues. I only have the gifts of interpretation. And you know what? I wish I had the gifts of tongues. Notice what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 20. He says, Brethren, do not be like children in your understanding, however, in malice. Be babies. They were malicing each other. They were quoting, they were, they were looking at what the other person was doing. And in other words, there was so much conflict in the church at Corinth. And the application for us this morning is that Though we do not have miraculous gifts today, we need diversity in the church. Amen? Amen? We need diversity in the church, and all of us have a variety of things that we can do for the Lord. We don't all have to do the same thing. Amen? We all have gifts. Now the question is, Brother Reed, what are those gifts? What are those gifts that we have today? Well, this is not an exhaust list. But in Romans chapter 12 and verse 6 through 8, Paul gives us the gifts that we have today. And the first gift that we see here in the list, if you look through your Bible, Romans chapter 12. Keep in mind, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is dealing with miraculous gifts. We do not have those today. Romans chapter 12 is dealing with the gifts that we do have today. Okay? So the first gift that we, that we see here is the gift of prophecy. Okay? This is just a passion to speak the word of God. To proclaim the word of God. This is not a foretelling. Again, this is not miraculous. This is just a passion to speak the word of God. This person has the passion to warn others concerning sin. That's what it means. For example, Paul had to rebuke Peter. Remember when Peter came in and Peter was sitting with the, with the Gentiles? When James came in, he, 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 just, he moved back. And Paul confronting right there and then. That is the, if you will, the ability to confront sin. To proclaim the word of God. That is the gift of prophecy. The other gift that we see in the list is the gift of ministry. This is the passion to serve others. This includes cooking. Right? I think Sister Adana just love cook. Right? <laughs> Do a great job, right? Cooking, cleaning, caring for the sick, okay? The needy, maintenance of the building, right? Like the deacons we see in Acts chapter 6, right? When they took care of the, the widows and so forth, when they were being overlooked, right? This is the gift of ministry. Then you had teach, teaching, the gift of teaching. This is the passion to give biblical information that has been researched. This is the person who just loves research. <laughs> right, Jenkins? <laughs> right? This is the person who go home and just say, and just on the internet, through the Bible, they try to find all the information. Amen? This is the, the, the passion here of teaching. Then you have the next gift of exhortation. This is the passion to encourage and comfort others while you're going through struggles. Amen? In Acts chapter 4 and verse number 36, Barnabas was considered, his, his name actually means son of encouragement. Amen. You have some people who are just able to encourage others. Right? They, they, they're very good at that. Right? Paul, when he was on, the, was on the ship and the men did not eat, the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 27 that he encouraged them. He says, men, eat something. That's a gift by itself to and be, be, be able to encourage someone when they're going through their struggles. The next gift is a giver. This is a passion to share with others. This person, every opportunity that, that they get, they're sharing. Every opportunity they're able to, to, to share, they, 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 they give their money. 
They give their time, they give themselves for the help of others. The next gift is leading or a leader. This is the passion to manage and keep things in order. Amen. Like Brother Odana, keep things in order. Brother Joshua, right? Keeping things, doing things, and we come to worship in order, right? Then the next gift is mercy, or a mercy giver. This is the gift that shows compassion to someone who is suffering. This person has the ability to stand in someone else's shoes. That person is able to empathize when a person is going through their struggles. Like the Good Samaritan, when they saw, he saw the man that was beat up, he took him in, put him on his own donkey, if you will, his own transportation, bring him to the inn, pay for him, right? This is that person, that mercy giver. So even in the body of Christ, brothers and sisters, we can see that God wants diversity. Everybody not going to be doing it, the same exact thing. Paul continues and tells us in verse number 20 through 26. And so even though we have a common salvation experience that unites us together, even though we, kept, we come from different backgrounds and we, are, we have different things, different gifts, we are completely dependent on each other. Amen. Which leads us to our, our last point. We are dependent on each other. Verse number 20. The Bible says, But now indeed there are many members, yet one, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which seems which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And and our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. Verse 24 tells us, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to the parts which lacks it, that there should be no schisms or fractions or divisions in the body but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all members suffer. Suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all members rejoice with it. Notice Paul describes that there are, that we are completely dependent on each other. Amen. He uses the phrase, he says, I don't need you. He says it twice. You see, there are those in the current church that was tempted to think that their gift, their position, their role, their function was more important than the others. And God is showing us that this is not a one-man show. This is not a one-person show. And sometimes we don't realize, brother, we sometimes do, don't realize how much work a person does until they are not here. Amen. Amen. We realize when Brother Elliot wasn't here how much work Brother Elliot does and how important he's a part of this body. Amen. We recognize, we realize when Brother O'Donnell's not here what he, Brother O'Donnell does. And so for when Brother Countryman goes on vacation and, and you know, we all are not here, we see how important uh, you are to this body. And so I can say to Brother Jenkins, I don't need you. Brother Jenkins can say to Brother Bravo, I don't need you. Brother Bravo can say to Brother Countryman, I don't need you. We all need each other. Let the church say amen. Amen. God is saying every member has their share of work. Amen. Listen to what Paul says in Ephesians 4 and verse number 6. That the body is knit together by every supporting ligament. According to the effective working by which every part does its work. Amen. What is the result? Causing growth in the body. 
if every member does not do their part, the body won't grow effectively. Amen. Every member have their part of the work to do. Every part is important for the growth of the body. We are so to be so joined together that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 26, the Bible says, if one member suffers, what? All members suffer. If one member suffers, all members suffer. Have you ever had a bad belly ache? No? What do you mean? A bad belly ache? What does the other members do? When I have a bad belly ache, my first member that runs to the rescue is my hand. Right? Your hand there massaging your stomach because your belly is hurting you. The next member that runs to the rescue is your foot. It crouched up, right, to ease the pain that's in your stomach. Your eyes looking to see if everything is okay. Everybody, every member is a part of it. It's trying, every member is trying to help to ease the pain, if you will. If brother, sis, brother sister Ramdes is feeling pain, we all feel pain. Amen. If brother Alwin and sister Alwin is feeling pain, we all feel pain. If Sister Cato is going through something, we all are going through something. Because all of us are one body. Can the church say amen? And thus, that's why we have to be so transparent with each other. Because the church can't suffer with me if I don't be transparent. If I don't let you know my struggles. And the church can't rejoice with me if I keep it to myself when, I, when, I, when, I'm, when I'm joyful. Paul says we are to be so connected to each other that we are so dependent on each other. So much so that when you rejoice, I rejoice. When you weep, I weep. That's the kind of body that God wants. Though we are so vastly different from different countries, Different states, different cultures, because of the blood of Christ, we are joined together. And that unbreakable bond makes me care about you, and you care about me. Let the church say amen. And lastly, Paul paints another picture of the body. Where maybe there are parts of the body that's fighting and thinking that the other parts of the body are getting more attention or more honor than the others. Well, in verse number 26, he says, If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. You know, I've never seen a reporter give honor to only one person on a 4 by one team, track. For those who know about track and field, okay? I've never seen a reporter give attention to only one person on a relay team. You see Bolt might be running the ankle leg and he runs fast and he goes through the finishing line but the reporter don't stay there and say, oh, you said, boy, you was the best. You, you did awesome. Um, you know, how did you carry around the baton all the way around the field? Because he didn't. If he gets praised, guess what? The entire team is going to get praised. If one member is honored, all the members are honored with it. It's a team effort, and thus, if the anchor leg does good, well, the entire team does good as well. You might be an ear, or an arm, or a foot. It doesn't matter. Your work brings glory to the rest of the body. Let the church say amen. amen. And so when Sister O'Donnell is serving, guess who is serving too? All of us. Praise the Lord. When Brother Countryman is serving. Guess what? We all are serving with him. When Sister Tomoy is giving, guess what? We, we give it too. Where Brother Jenkins and Brother Bravo is, is exhorting, guess what? Every member of the Church of Christ, East Valley Church of Christ, is exhorting too. Let the church say amen. Paul ends this section 
by saying now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these in the church first. Apostles, second prophets, third teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administration, verities of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all works of miracles? Do we all have gifts of healing? Do we all speak tongues? Do we all interpret? So here, the Corinthian church, Christians, and then maybe they are seeking a particular gift. Are you going to understand everybody wanted to speak in tongues? I know what it was. <laughs> everybody wanted to speak in tongues. And Paul is saying that not every person is going to have the same gift. Okay? He concludes and saying, verse number 31, but earnestly desire the best gift, and yet I show you the more excellent way. The question is, what is the more excellent way? But if you want to know that, come on the next time. <laughs> God's will. And we'll talk about that. God tells us that in order for one to be a part of the body of Christ, there's something that you have to do, right? The Bible tells us that one must hear the word of God. What exactly are you to hear? You've got to hear the gospel, the good news. Jesus Christ died according to his sins. He was buried and he also rose, up, rose again according to the scriptures. You have to hear that good news that he loved you so much that he died for you. That you may have the chance of eternal life. You must believe the message, right? Because, uh, because the Bible says, but without faith it's impossible to please God. You must believe that. One must repent. That means one must have a change of mind. Saying that, you know what? The things that I'm used to doing, I'm not going to do anymore. I'm going to make a one in turn. And I have to give my life to God. One must confess Jesus Christ as the Son of God. That, that is saying, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You're confessing what you believe, not confessing your sins. Jesus already knows your sins. One must be baptized. This is not sprinkling. This is, this is an immersion. One is buried in water. To rise to be the of life. One must also be faithful until death. And when Jesus Christ comes back, he, he tells us that heaven will be your home. As we stand and sing a song of encouragement.